So now we're beginning section nine of the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. Once more, if you would like more commentary on this gospel, please join us on Tuesday nights on the Dark Outpost, section nine, lections 81 through 89. Lection 81, the Roman trial before Pilate, verse one. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas into the hall of judgment to Pontius Pilate the governor, and it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might keep the feast. Pilate therefore went out unto them and said, What accusations bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up to thee. We have a law, and by our law he ought to die because he would change the customs and rites which Moses delivered unto us, ye he made himself the Son of God. So if you remember from last week, some of the charges against Jesus, it wasn't just the fact that the Pharisees and the rabbis said that Jesus was speaking blasphemy because he was claiming to be the Son of God, but it was also because he technically broke the laws of Moses, which was to slaughter a lamb at the Passover. If you can remember from last week, Judas brought a lamb to the Passover feast, and Jesus said to leave it alone, not to sacrifice the lamb. Of course, throughout this whole gospel, we've seen Jesus push vegetarianism and to take care of the animals, because the animals are our brothers and sisters. This brings us to verse 3. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. So Pontius Pilate doesn't even want to be a part of this anymore. He's like, you guys are envious of this man. You judge him. I don't want to be a part of this thing you've got going on with this guy. Verse 4. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put a man to death. So the sayings of Jesus would fulfill, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. And they further accused him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nations and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. So now they're trying to manipulate Pontius Pilate, right? Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell you it of me? So Jesus is asking, Do you believe I'm the king of the Jews, or did they tell you that? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nations and chief priests have delivered thee upon me, and what hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, and I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am, ye a king I am. To this end I was born, and for this cause I came into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate said unto him, What is truth? Jesus said, Truth is from heaven. Pilate said, Then truth is not on earth. Jesus said unto Pilate, Believe thou that truth is on earth amongst those who receive and obey it. They are of the truth who judge righteously. And we had heard this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. And when he was accused, the chief priests and elders, he answered them nothing. Then Pilate said unto them, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. And again he said unto them, I find no fault in this man. And they waxed the more fiercely, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he saw that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at the time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he was desirous to see him for a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracles done by him. Then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him, 
and many false witnesses rose up against him, and laid to his charge things that he knew not. And Herod with his men of war sent him at naught, and mocked him, and arrayed him with a gorgeous robe, and sent him to Pilate. And the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. And Pilate went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have the power to crucify thee, and have the power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thence Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art no Caesar's friend. Whoever so maketh him a king speaketh against Caesar. So again, they're trying to manipulate Pontius Pilate. I actually have a lot of empathy for Pontius Pilate. We talked about this on the Dark Outpost last week when we covered Section 9. Pontius Pilate was put between a rock and a hard place, and it does seem that Jesus absolved Pontius Pilate of the fate that was about to befall Jesus because basically Jesus was like you're here because God wants you here because this prophecy has to be fulfilled and honestly like Pontius Pilate really wants to let Jesus go because he sees that there's nothing wrong with with Jesus this brings us to verse 21 Pilate called together the chief priest and rulers of the people. When he was set down on judgment seat, his wife sent upon him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. And Pilate said unto them, Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people. And behold, I have examined him before you, and have no, found no fault in this man touching those things. Whereof ye accuse him? No, nor yet Herod, for I have sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death was found in him. But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will you therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? So now Pilate's like, listen, okay, so you have this Passover rule that I'm going to release a prisoner. So maybe if I give you that option to release Jesus, you'll release him because Jesus has done absolutely nothing wrong. And it's absolutely ridiculous that you brought him to me because I see that you were just actually envious of his popularity. Sorry, guys, we were interrupted by a car alarm going off. So anyway, now we go to verse 24. Then they cried again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber, and for sedition made in the city, and for murder was cast into prison. Pilate, therefore willing to release Jesus, spake again to them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you, Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus which is called the Christ? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said unto them, What then shall I do with Jesus, which is called the Christ? And they say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why, what evil hath he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto him, Behold again that I bring forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. And again they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said unto them the third time, Why, what evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they were ins insistent with loud voices, requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See you to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our ch children. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required, and he delivered Jesus to their will. Election 82, The Crucifixion. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. When the soldiers of the governor took Jesus to the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him and put on him a purple robe, and when they had plaited a th crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said unto them, Behold this man. 
When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they mocked him. They took the robe off of him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they led him away, they behold one Simon, a Syrian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and laminated him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? And there was also two other male factors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come into a place called Calgary and Golgotha, that is to stay a place of the skull, where they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And it was in the third hours when they crucified him, and they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And Jesus said, Abba, Amma, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his raiment and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his vesture. Now the vesture was out without seam, woven from the top and throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it and cast lots for it, those who it shall be. That the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vestures they did cast lot. These things, therefore, the soldiers did, and sitting down, they watched him there. And a superscription was also written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And this title then read, Many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests to the Jews and to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into the kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, To this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that wouldest destroy the temple and build it three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocked him, while the scribes and elders said, He saved a lamb he himself cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down off the Christ, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. The users and the dealers and beasts and birds also cast the like things into his teeth, saying, Thou who drivest from the temple the traitors and oxen and sheep and doves art thyself but a sheep that is sacrificed. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land unto the ninth hour, and some standing around lightened their torches, for the darkness was very great. And about the sixth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them stood there when they heard this, and said, This man calleth for Elias, and others said he calleth on the sun. The rest said, let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Now there stood by the cross Jesus his mother and his mother's sister and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And he said to his disciples, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciples took her into his own home. 
After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, saith, I am a thirst. And from a vessel they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon a stick, and put it to his mouth. And Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Abba, Amma, into thy hand I command my spirit. When Jesus had therefore received the vinegar, he cried aloud, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And it was the ninth hour. And behold, there was a great thunder and lightning, and the partition wall of the holy place from which hung the veil fell down, and was rent in twain, and earth did quake, and the rocks were also rent. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watched Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God. And many, many women were there, which followed from Galilee, ministering unto them, and among them were Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Jonas, and the mother of Zebedee, children, and they laminated, saying, The light of the world is hid from our eyes, and the Lord, our love, is crucified. Then the Jews, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath, for it was Passover Sabbath, they besought Pilate, and their legs might be broken that they might be taken down. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the two who were crucified with, with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was dead already. They break not his legs. But one soldier with the spear pierced, pierced his heart and floweth came there out blood and water. And when he saw it was bare record and his record is true, he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture might be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, in the midst of the week, the Messiah shall be cut off. Lection 83, The Burial of Jesus Now when the event came, Joseph of Arameth, an honorable counselor who also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went and boldly upon Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. He was a good man and just, and had not consented to the counsel and the deed of them. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead. And calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead. And when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. He gave the, came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred weight. And they took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen cloths with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, there was a new specular, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, and it was about the beginning of the second watch when they buried him because of Jesus' preparation day, for the specular was nigh at hand. So a specular is a um, burial room, a room where they laid the bodies, as we know that's where Jesus was laid inside of a tomb. So it's kind of like a tomb. Basically, they're saying this, this tomb had never been used before. He was the only body inside of it. This brings us to verse 5. And Mary Magdalene and the other Mary and the Mary of Jonas beheld where he laid. There at the tomb they kept watch for three days and three nights. And the women also who came with him from Galilee followed after bearing lamps in their heads and beheld the specular and how his body was laid and they made lamentations over him. And they returned and rested the next day being a high day, and on the day following, they brought and prepared spices and ointments and waited for the end of the Sabbath. Now the next day that followed, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that deceiver said, While he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that a specular be made sure unto the third day be passed, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it sure as you can. So they went and made the specular sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch till the third day should pass. 
So yeah, we spoke about this on the on the Dark Outpost. This is also in the canonized Bible that these priests and these Pharisees who already brought Jesus to Pontius Pilate to be crucified because they were envious of Jesus were now concerned that the disciples would steal Jesus's body and trick people and say that he had risen from the dead. So now they're asking Pilate to send guards to like guard the tomb to make sure that they don't do this. And Pilate's like, whatever, man, just get your guys and go go guard the tomb. Do what you got to do. So this brings us to lecture 84, the resurrection of Jesus. Verse 1. Now after the Sabbath was ended and it began to dawn, on the first day of the week came Mary Magdalene to the specular, bearing spices which she had prepared, and there were others with her. And as they were going, they said among themselves, Who shall roll away the stone from the door of the specular? For it was great. And when they had come to the place and looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away. So again, they put a stone in front of the tomb so that people couldn't get in and out. We again talked about this on the dark outpost. It was a really heavy stone. Women could not have moved that stone. And as the women are walking up to the tomb, they're actually worried about getting into the tomb to be able to put spices on the body because they know that there is now a stone in front of it. Now we get to verse 3, For behold, there was a great earthquake, and the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countess was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became dead as men. I take this to mean the whole place as, and for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. They freaking passed out because they were so afraid. I, I don't blame them. That would be pretty... um. Pretty, pretty intense to see that happened. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly, and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. And they entered in and found not the body of Jesus. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the specular, and we know not where they have laid him. And they ran and came to the specular, and looking in, they saw the linen clothes lying, and the napkin that had been laid about his head not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped in a place by itself. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed, behold, Two angels stood by then in glistening garments of white and said unto him, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, he is risen. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall we see him. Remember ye not how he spake unto you when he was not in Galilee? And the Son of Man should be crucified, and he would rise again on the third day? And they remembered his words, and they went out quickly and fled from the specular, for they trembled with amazement, and they were afraid. Now at the time of the earthquake the graves were open, and many of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the city, and appeared unto many. But Mary stood without at the specular weeping. And as she wept, she again stooped down and looked into the specular, and saw two angels in white garments and one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not it, that it was Jesus. So remember, we have learned throughout this gospel and the other Gnostic gospels we've studied that Mary Magdalene was Jesus' wife. Jesus does say this many times throughout the gospel. She was actually his second wife. He was, we know from this gospel that he was married at the age of 18 to another woman named Miriam who died seven years after, after their marriage. And then he married Mary Magdalene. So for Mary Magdalene, the death of Jesus is, is, is way more intense, probably on a very human level than the other disciples because Jesus was her Christ, was her Messiah, was her teacher and was also her husband. And so I, I can't even imagine what she was going through and the confusion and all the emotions that she was experiencing. So now we get to verse 13. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Who seekest thou? 
She supposing him to be the gardener saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where that thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said unto her, Mary. And she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, one with my mother. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my parent and your parent, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her, and commanded her to announce his resurrection from the dead. This brings us to lection 85, Jesus risen again, appear at two at the Emmaus. And behold, two of them went the same day to the village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlong. And they walked together of all these things which has happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were holden that they should not know him. So these two guys are chatting, talking about all these crazy things that have happened in, in Jerusalem. You know, the earthquake, the guy rising from the dead, all this stuff. And Jesus appears, and they don't know it's Jesus, but appears to them while they're walking down the street. Verse 3, And he said unto them, What matter of communications are these that ye are having with one another as ye walk and are sad? So Jesus is like, What's going on? Why are you guys so sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleophas, answered, saying unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which have come to pass there in these days? And he said unto him, What things? I find this a little humorous. We talked about this on the dark outpost. Cleophas is like, Dude, you're not new from here. You're obviously like in Jerusalem. You, you know what happened. Something pretty big has happened in Jerusalem. And Jesus is like, What happened? Tell me what happened. I don't know. Which I find kind of funny. Verse 5, And they said unto him, Considering, Concerning Jesus of Nazar Nazareth, who is also a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all of this, three days have passed since these things were done. So remember too, guys, the, the, the old Jewish faith, they knew that there was going to be a Messiah that was going to come to free Israel. Like that was in their, the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. And they were sure that Jesus was the one. Now, I think what the confusion was is they didn't realize that this was a spiritual saving, not an actual saving of an earthly kingdom. Um, the Isra Israelites of the olden days definitely went through hell and back, being enslaved by so many different nations. And so they were expecting a real, like, literal releasing of Israel. And what Jesus came to do, the Messiah came to do, was, was spiritual. Which is then, as we get into the early Christian faith, we're obviously getting to Gnosis or Gnosticism, which is what the original faith was all about. This brings us to verse 6. Ye and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which we were early at the speculier, where they found not his body. They came, saying that they had also seen visions of angels, who said that he was alive. And of certain of them who were with us went to the speculier, and found it even so as the woman had said, but he they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools and soul of heart, to believe all that the prophets had spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things, and then enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in the scriptures these things concerning himself. And when they drew nigh unto the village, whether they went, he made as though he would have gone further, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us. For it is towards the evening, and the day is far spent. He went into tarry with them. So Jesus was going to keep traveling, but the two two guys who didn't know it was Jesus was like, No, 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 you can't. It's getting It's getting late. You should come with us. And it came to pass that he sat at the table with them. He took bread, the fruit of the vine, and gave thanks, blessed, and break, and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of sight. So all of a sudden, as they're eating, they figure out it's Jesus. And right as they realize who they've been talking to this whole time, he vanished. And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the twelve gathered together, and them that were saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. 
and they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking the bread. Now while they had been going to Emmaus, some of them of the watch came into the city and showed unto Caiaphas what things had been done. And they assembled with the elders and took counsel and said, Behold, while the soldiers slept, some of his disciples came and took his body away. And is not Joseph of Armiatha one of his disciples? For this cause then did he beg for the body from Pilate that he might bury it in the garden in his own tomb. Let us therefore give money to the soldiers, saying, Yea, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the ears of the governor, we will persuade him and secure you so they're still not believing it like they still think that this really rich joseph guy like paid off the the guards so that they could take the body of jesus and fool everybody these pharisees just don't quite get it do they lection 86 jesus appears in the temple and blood sacrifices cease verse 1 the same day at the time of sacrifice in the temple there appeared among the dealers and the beast and in the birds one clothed in white raiment bright as light and in his hand a whip of seven cords he's already when he was in human form before his crucifixion he already whipped all of them in the temple and now we're seeing him again in spirit form whipping as well and at the sight of him those who sold and bought fled in terror and some of them fell as dead men for they remembered how before his death jesus had driven them away from the temple and closed in the like manner and some declared that they had seen a spirit and others said that they had seen him who was crucified and that that he had risen from the dead and the sacrifices ceased that day in the temple for all were in fear and none could be had to sell or buy, but rather let their captives go free. And the priests and elders caused a report to be spread, that they who had seen it were drunken, and that they had seen nothing. But many had affirmed they had seen him with their own eyes, and felt on their backs the scourge, where the, the, but were powerless to resist. For when some of the bolder among them put forth their hands, they could not seize this form which they beheld, nor grasped the whip, which chastised them. And from that time, these believed in Jesus and that he was sent from the God to deliver and oppress them and free those who were bound. And they turned from their ways and sinned no longer. To others, he also appeared in love and mercy and healed them by his touch and delivered them from the hands of the persecutor. And many light things were reported of him and many said, of a truth, the kingdom has come. And some of those who slept and risen when Jesus rose from the dead appeared and were seen by many in the holy city and a great fear fell upon the wicked, but the light and gladness came to the righteous at heart. Lection 87, Jesus appeareth to his disciples. Verse 1. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were afraid and supposed they had seen a spirit. So remember, the, the disciples are, are fugitives now. They, they're hiding. Uh, we've talked about this many, many times going through their, the, the Gospels that were lost from like Philip and Mary and all the other disciples that weren't included in in the canonized bible but they were fugitives they knew that that they um the ruling elite wanted them dead verse 2 and he say unto them behold it is i myself like as ye have seen me after time a spirit can indeed appear in flesh and bones as ye see me have behold my hands and my feet handle and see and when he had said so he showed unto them his hands and his heart then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. For Thomas called Didymus, that's another gospel we started with actually when we went through these Gnostic gospels, was the Thomas, the gospel of Thomas or Didymus, which means the twin. One of the disciples had said unto them, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his heart, I will not believe. Then saith he to Thomas, behold my hands, my heart and my feet, reach hither thy hands and not be faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Very famous line from Doubting Thomas. And Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. 
Then saith Jesus unto them, Peace be unto you, as Abba Amma hath sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye Holy Ghost, preach the gospel, and announce ye unto all nations the resurrection of the Son of Man. Teach ye the holy law of love which I delivered unto you, and whosoever forsaketh their sin, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever continue in their sins, they are retained unto them. Baptize then who believe and repent, bless and anoint them, and offer ye the pure oblation of the fruits of the earth, which I have appointed unto you for a memorial of me. Lo, I have given my body and my blood to be offered on the cross for the redemption of the world from sin against love and from the bloody sacrifice and feast of the past. And ye shall offer the bread of life and the wine of salvation for a pure oblation with incense as it is written of me, and ye shall eat and drink thereof for a memorial that I have delivered all who believe in me from the ancient bondage of your ancestors. For they, making a god of their belly, sacrificed unto to their god the innocent creatures of the earth in place of the carnal nature within themselves. So again, the eating of meat. And eating of their flesh and drinking of their blood to their own destruction, corrupted their bodies and shortened their days, even as the Gentiles who knew not the truth, or who knowing it have changed it into a lie. And it's interesting, David mentioned that before in the Dark Outpost, that in the uh, Old Testament, we see people living for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And so it seems that they possibly lived for that long because they did not eat meat. And Jesus is saying that now, that they shorten their days because they started eating meat. As I send you, so send ye others also to do these things in my name. And he laid his hands upon them. In the like manner as the apostles, so also be ordained prophets and evangelists and pastors, a holy priesthood. And afterward, he laid his hands upon those they chose for deacons, one of each of the four twelve. And these are for the rule and guidance of the church universal, that all may be perfected in their places in the unity of the body of the Christ. So this brings us to lection 88, the eighth day after the resurrection, verse 1. And after seven days again, his disciples were within the upper room. Then came Jesus, the door being shut, and stood in their midst, and said, Peace be unto you. And he was known unto them in holy memorial. And he said unto them, Love ye one another and all the creatures of God. Yet I say unto you, Not all are men who are in, in the form of men. Are they men or women in the image of God, whose ways are ways of violence, of oppression, and wrong, who choose to lie rather than the truth? Verily, till they are born again, and receive the spirit of love and wisdom within their hearts, then only are they sons and daughters of Israel. And being of Israel, they are children of God. And for this cause I came into the world, and for this I have suffered at the hands of sinners. So again, Remember, the Israelites or the kingdom of Israel is not an actual place. It's a group of people. It's people that follow the law of love or the law of Jesus. Verse 4. These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in Psalms concerning me. And Jesus said, I stood in the midst of the world. And in the flesh was I seen and heard, and I found all men glutted with their own pleasures, and drunk with their own follies, and none found I hungry or a thirst for the wisdom which is of God. My soul grieveth over the sons and daughters of the men, because they are blind in their heart, and in their soul they are deaf and hear not my voice. Then opening he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it is behooved the Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead after the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in my name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send my promise of my parent upon you, even of my father, one with my mother, whom you have not seen on this earth. For I say unto you of truth, as the whole world 
have been ruined by the sin and vanity of woman, so by the simplicity and truth of woman shall it be saved. Even by you shall it be saved. Rejoicing, therefore, and be glad, for ye are more blessed than all who are on earth. For it is ye, my twelve thousand, who shall save the whole world. Again I say unto you, when the greatest tyrant and all the seven tyrants begin to fight in vain against the light, they knew not with whom or what they fought. For they saw nothing beyond a dazzling light, and when they fought, they expanded their strength against one another, and so it is. And for this cause, I took forth part of their strength, so they might not have such power and prevail in their evil deeds. For by involution and evolution shall the salvation of the world be accomplished by the dis descent of spirit into matter and the ascent of matter into spirit through the ages. So he's saying that this faith is going to evolve and go all over the world, which we know is, is true. Lection 89, this is the last, last lection of section 9. And this is Jesus appeareth at the sea. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the sea. And on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and James and John and two other of his disciples. And Peter saith unto, unto them, I go fishing. And they say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. And then when morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. So it's interesting, Jesus told them to stop, you guys shouldn't be eating meat, and then they went fishing and they couldn't, they couldn't catch anything. That's kind of funny. Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have ye any meat? So Jesus is testing them. They answered him, Nay, Lord, not enough for all. There is not but a small loaf, a little oil, and a few dried fruits. And he saith unto them, Let these suffice, come and dine. Like again, let this suffice. Do not eat the fish. Do not eat the animals. Don't do that. They are God's children too. And he blessed them, and they ate and were filled. And there was a pitcher of water also, and he blessed it likewise, and lo, it was the fruit of the vine. And they marveled and said, Is it the Lord? And none of the disciples thus asked him, Who art thou, knowing it was the Lord? This is now the sixth time Jesus showed himself to his disciples. After that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Peter, son of Jonas, Lovest me more than these? And he saith unto them, Ye Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him again the second time, Peter, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, they knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him a third time, Peter, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he had said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus said unto him, Feed my flock, verily, verily, I say unto thee, Thou art a rock, and from the rock, and on this rock, I will build my church. And I will raise thee above my twelve to be my vice guard upon the earth for a century of unity to the twelve, and another shall be called and chosen to fill thy place among the twelve. And thou shalt be the servant of servants, and shall feed my rams and my sheep and my lambs. And yet another shall rise, and he shall teach many things which I have taught you already, and he shall spread the gospel among the Gentiles with great zeal. But the keys of the kingdom will I give to those who succeed thee in my spirit and obeying my law. And again I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walketh whither thou wouldest. But when thou be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands in another, and shall gird these, and carry thee whither thou wast not. This spake he signifying, excuse me, by what death he should glorify God. So yes, in a very old English way, he is telling Peter that he's going to die of crucifixion as well, which we know is true. And when he had spoken with this, he saith unto him, follow me. Then Peter turning about, seeing the disciples whom Jesus loved, following Peter, seeing him saith to Lord, Jesus, what shall this man do? Jesus saith upon him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is thou to thee? Follow thou to me. Then when the saying abroad among the brethren that the disciples should 
not die. Yet Jesus said unto him, He shall not die, but if I will, he will tarry till I come. What is done to thee? And that ends section 9. So this brings us to section 10, lection 90 through 96. This will end the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, which I'm very sad to see this Gospel go, but I'm sure we will find lots more interesting stories from the other um, band or heretical Gospels. So section 10, lection 90 is titled, What is Truth? Verse 1. Again the twelve were gathered together in the circle of palm trees, and one of them, even Thomas, said to the other, What is truth? For the same things appear different to different minds, and even to the same mind at different times. What, then, is truth? It's a very, very good point. Seems like we're getting into some gnosis, some inner knowledge, the idea that truth can at times be relative. Verse 2 says, And as they were speaking, Jesus appeared in their midst and said, Truth, one and absolute, is in God alone. For no man, neither any body of men, knoweth that which God alone knoweth, who is the all in all. To men is truth revealed according to their capacity to understand and receive. That makes a lot of sense, right? The one truth hath many sides, and one seeth one side only, another seeth another, and some sees more than others, according as, as it is given to them. Behold this crystal, how the one light is manifest in twelve faces, yea, four times twelve, and each face reflect one ray of light, and one regardeth one face and one another, but it is in the one crystal and the one light that shineth in all. Behold again, when one climbeth a mountain and attain one height, he saith, This is the top of the mountain, let us reach it. And when they have reached that height, lo, they see another beyond it until they come to that height from which no other height is to be seen. If so, be they can attain it. So it is with truth. I am the truth and the way and the light, and have given to you the truth I have received from above, and that which is seen and received by one, and is not seen and received by another. That which appeareth true to some seemeth not true to others. They who are in the valley see not as they who are on top of the hill." But to each it is truth, as the one mind seeth, and for that time, till a higher truth shall be revealed unto the same, and to the soul which receiveth higher light shall be given more light. Wherefore, condemn not others, that ye be not condemned. So don't judge other people, because you can see more reality than they can. Don't judge them, because you still have more to learn as well. That makes total sense to me. It's like that saying, the more that you learn, the less you actually know. Verse 8 goes on to say, As ye keep the holy law of love which I have given unto you, so shall the truth be revealed more and more unto you. And the spirit of the truth which cometh from above shall guide you, albat through many wanderings into all truth, even as the fiery cloud guided the children of Israel through the wilderness. Be faithful to the light ye have, till a higher light is given to you. Seek more light, and ye shall have abundantly. Rest not till ye find. God giveth you all truth as a ladder with many steps for the salvation and perfection of the soul. And the truth which seemeth today ye will abandon for the higher truth of the morrow. Press ye unto perfection. Whoso keepeth the holy law which I have given, the same shall have their souls, however differently when they may see the truth which I have given. Many shall say unto me, Lord, Lord, we have been zealous for thy truth, but I shall say unto them, Nay, but that others may see as ye see, and none other truth beside. Faith without clarity is dead. Love is the fulfillment of law. How shall faith and what they perceive profit them that hold it in unrighteousness? 
They who have love have all things, and without love there is nothing worth. Let each hold what they see to be the truth in love, knowing that where love is not, truth is dead, letter, and profited nothing. So do all things in love. You know, there are a lot of churches out there, a lot of Christian churches out there that do things out of hate. They use God and they use Jesus and they use the faith as a weapon to try to condemn people for their lust for violence, which obviously Jesus is saying here that that's, that's not correct. We do things in love. Verse 14 goes on to say, There abide goodness, truth, and beauty, but the greatest of these is goodness. If any have hatred to their fellows and harden their hearts to the creatures of God's hands, how can they see the truth unto salvation? Seeing their eyes are blinded and their hearts are hardened to God's creation? As I have received the truth, so have I given it to you. Let each receive it according to their light and ability to understand. And persecute not those who receive it after a different interpretation. Interesting, don't persecute people who have a different opinion of you, a different truth, if it's all done in love. Very interesting, isn't it? For the truth is the might of God, and it shall prevail in the end over all errors. But the holy law which I have given is the plan for all, and just and good. Let all observe it for the salvation of their soul. This takes us to lection 91, the order of the kingdom, part 1. Verse 1. In that time after Jesus had risen from the dead, he tarried ninety days with Mary his mother and Mary Magdalene, who anointed his body, and Mary Cleophas and the twelve and their fellows, instructing them and answering questions concerning the kingdom of God. So he hung out with them for about three months, that's ninety days after he had risen. And as they ate supper, even it was even, Mary Magdalene asked him, saying, Master, wilt thou now declare us the order of the kingdom? And Jesus answered, saying, Verily I say unto thee, O Mary, and to each of any disciple, the kingdom of heaven is within you. But the time cometh when that which is within shall be made manifest in the without for the sake of the world. Order indeed is good and needful, but before all things is love. Love ye one another and all the creatures of God, and by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. And one asked him, saying, Master, wilt thou the infants be received into congregation in like manner as Moses commanded by the circumcision. And Jesus answered, For those who are in Christ, there is no cutting of flesh, nor shedding of blood. That's fascinating. Wow. Okay. So that's saying that, that there should be no more circumcising. I'm not a man, so I don't really have an opinion on that. I just find that very, very fascinating. Let the infant of eight days be presented unto the father and mother who is in heaven with prayer and thanksgiving, and let a name be given to it by its parents. And let the presbyter sprinkle pure water upon it according to that which is written in the prophets, and let its parents see to it that it is brought up with the ways of righteousness, neither eating flesh, nor drinking strong, strong drink, nor hurting the creatures which God hath given into the hands of man to protect." Yeah, so we should not be raising our children as meat eaters or drinkers, apparently. Interesting, right? Again, one said unto him, Master, how wilt thou when they grow up? And Jesus answered, After seven years, or when they begin to know the evil from good and learn to choose good, let them come unto me and receive the blessings at hand of the presbyter or the angel of the church with prayer and thanksgiving, and let them be abonished to keep from flesh eating and strong drink, and from hunting the innocent creatures of God. For shall they be lower than the horse or the sheep to, to whom these things are against nature? And again he said, If there come to us any that eat flesh and drink strong drink, shall we receive them? And Jesus said unto him, Let such abide in the outer court till they cleanse themselves from these grosser evils, or till they perceive and repent of these. They are not fit to receive the higher mysteries. 
Wow, that's super interesting. So if you're still eating meat, he's saying you there are certain things you won't understand because your mind is being influenced by the way your body is reacting to the meat you're eating. I this it, this makes sense to me with yoga. We we cleanse our bodies with yoga too so that our mind may be pure and not corrupted. Verse 9 goes on to say and another asking him, "When when wilt thou they receive baptism?" And Jesus answered, After another seven years, or when they know the doctrine, and do that which is good, and learn to work with their own hands, and choose a craft whereby they may live, and they are steadfastly set on the right way. Then let them ask for initiation, and let the angel or presbyter of the church examine them and see if they are worthy. And let him offer thanksgiving and prayer, and bury them in the waters of separation, that they may rise to newness of life, confessing God as their father and mother, vowing to obey the holy law, and keep themselves separate from the evil in the world. And another asked him, Master, at what time shall they receive the anointing? And Jesus answered, When they have reached the age of maturity, and manifested in themselves the sevenfold gifts of the Spirit. Then let the angel offer prayer and thanksgiving and seal them with the seal of chrism. It is good that all be tried in each degree seven years. Nevertheless, let it be unto each according to their own growth in love and wisdom of God. So I grew up Presbyterian, and in the Presbyterian church, we are baptized as babies. I was born in February of 1983, and I was actually baptized by that Easter of 1983. And so Jesus is saying not to do that, though. He's saying that we should be older and we should actually understand what's happening when we take the baptism. However, I do know that from ancient culture, that the baptism of babies was something that um, our ancestors did out of fear that a baby would die early. They thought that by having the baptism, the baby would enter into paradise, which in my opinion, the baptism really doesn't matter at all because it's all about the integrity and, and the intent of the heart and the soul. Now, it's interesting with my yoga practice, I do every single morning. I feel like that's my daily baptism. It's my daily anointing of the Spirit of God or trying to find that Spirit of God, that peace of God, so that I can go about my day in the law of love and doing it everything in love. Sometimes I fail, as we all do, but it's very interesting how he talked about it, how it needs to be reoccurring. So this brings us to lecture 92, which is the Order of the Kingdom, Part 2, verse 1. And another asked him, Master, wilt thou there be marriages among us, as is it among the nations of the earth? And Jesus answered, saying, Among some it is the custom that one woman marry several men, who shall say unto her, Be thou our wife, and take away our reproach. Among others it is the custom that one marry several women. And who shall say unto him, Be thou our husband, and take away our reproach? For they who love feel it as a reproach to be unloved. But unto you, my disciples, I show a better and more perfect way. Even this, that marriage should between, be between one man and one woman, who by perfect love and symphony are united, and while love and life do last, how by imperfect freedom. And let them see to it that they have perfect health, and that they truly love each other in all purity, and not for worldly advantages only. And then let them plight their troth one to another before witnesses." And then we go on to verse 3. Then when the time has come, let the angel or presbyter offer prayer and thanksgiving and bind them with this scarlet cord. For ye will and crown them and lead them thrice around the altar and let them eat one of the bread and drink of one cup. Then holding their hands together, let him say to them in this wise, Be ye two in one. Blessed be the holy union for whom God doth join together. Let no man put asunder so long as life and love do last. And if they bear children, let them do so with discretion and prudence according to their ability to maintain them. Wow, that's interesting. There are people in the Christian faith who uh, practice quiverful, which is having as many children as you possibly can. Um, but Jesus is saying here, be uh, mindful, you know, with discretion. I don't think he's saying to go have an abortion by any means, but I'm seeing like you can try to not to get pregnant. That's super interesting. 
Nevertheless, to those who would be perfect and to whom it is giving, I say, let them be as angels of God in heaven, who neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor have children, nor care for the morrows, but are free from bond, even as I am, and keep and store up the powers of God within for their ministry, for works of healing, even as I have done, but that many cannot receive the saying, only they to whom it is given." So this brings us to verse 5. And another asked him, saying, Master, in what manner shall we offer the holy oblation? And Jesus answered, saying, The oblation which God loveth in secret is a pure heart. But for a memorial of worship offer ye unleavened bread, mingled wine, oil, and incense. And ye come together in one place to offer the holy oblation, the lamps being lightened, let whom who presideth even the angel of the church or the presbyter, having clean hands and a pure heart, take from the things offered unleavened bread and mingled wine with incense. And let him give thanks over them and bless them, calling upon the Father, Mother in heaven to send their Holy Spirit that it may come upon and make them to be the body and blood, even the substance and life of the eternal, which is ever being broken and shed for all. And let him lift it up towards heaven and pray for all, even for those who are gone before, for those who are yet alive, and for those who are yet to come. As I have taught you, so pray ye. And after this, let him break the bread and put a fragment in the cup, and then bless the holy union, and let him give unto the faithful, saying after this manner, This is the body of Christ, even the substance of God, ever being broken and shed for you and for all, unto eternal life. As ye have seen me do, so do ye also in the spirit of love. For the words I speak unto you, they are the spirit and they are life. This brings us to lecture 93, the order of the kingdom, part 3. And spake another, saying, Master, if one hath committed sin, can a man remit or attain his sin? And Jesus said, God forgiveth all sin to those who repent. But as ye sow, also must ye reap. So even though God is going to forgive you, that's not going to take you away from, from karma, right? What goes around comes around. You have to cause an effect. You have to go through the consequences of your actions. Neither God nor man can remit the sins of those who repent nor forsake their sins, nor yet retain the sins of those who forsake them. But if one being in spirit seeth clearly that any repent and forsake their sins, such may truly say unto the penitent, Thy sins are forget forgiven thee. For all sin is remitted by repentance and amendment, and they are loosed from it, who forsaken it and bound it, who continue it. Nevertheless, the fruit of sin must continue for a season. For as we sow, must we reap. For God is not mocked. And they who sow to the flesh shall reap corruption. And they who sow to the Spirit shall reap life everlasting. Wherefore it any forsake their sins and confess them, let the presbyter say unto such in this wise, May God forgive thee thy sins and bring thee to everlasting life. All sin against God is forgiven by God, and sin against man by man. And another asked him, saying, If any be sick among us, shall we have power to heal, even as thou doest? And Jesus answered, This power cometh of perfect chastity and of faith. They who are born of God keep their seed within them. Nevertheless, if any be sick among you, let them sin for the presbytery of the church, that they may anoint them with oil of olive in the name of the Lord and prayer of faith. And the going out of power with the voice of thanksgiving shall rise them up, if they are not detained by sin of this or a former life. So sometimes what we're going through in life cannot be fixed because it is the effect of something we did a cause we had in a prior existence. And throughout this, we've seen Jesus speak of this cycle of birth and death, and that reincarnation was a pillar of the Christian faith in the original faith. Verse 5, And another asked him, Master, how shall the holy assemble be ordered, and who shall minister therein? 
And Jesus answered, When my disciples are gathered in my name, let them choose from among themselves true and faithful men and women who shall be ministers and counselors in temporal things and provide for the necessities of the poor and those who cannot work. And let these look to ordering of the goods of the church and assist in the oblation, and let these be your deacons with their help. And when these have given proof of their ministry, let them choose from them who has spiritual gifts, gifts of guidance or prophecy or of preaching, of teaching and healing, that they may edify the flock, offer the holy oblation, and minister the mysteries of God. And let these be your presbyters and their helps. And from these who have served well in their degree, let one be chosen who is counted in most worthy, and let him preside over all, and he shall be your angel. And let the angel ordain the deacons, and consecrate the presbyters, anoint them, and laying their hands upon them, and breathing upon them, that they may receive the Holy Spirit for the office to which they are called. And as the angel, let one of the higher ministry anoint and consecrate him, even one of the supreme council. For as I send apostles and prophets, so also I send evangelists and pastors for eight and forty pillars of the tabernacle, that by the ministry of the four I may build upon and perfect my church, and they shall sit in Jerusalem, a holy congregation, each with his helper and deacon, and to them shall be scattered congregations, refer in all matters pertaining to the church. And as light cometh to, shall they rule and guide and edify and teach my holy church. They shall receive light from it, and to all shall they give more light. So it's interesting because we know from the last section and from the Bible, the canonized Bible, that Peter is the disciple that God or Jesus built his church upon. And we know that Peter, St. Peter's Basilica, is in Rome, Italy. But we also know that the Vatican means the head of the serpent. And we know that the Catholic Church has been heavily corrupted. And we see in a lot of these other Gospels that Jesus' brother, James, was ahead of the church in Jerusalem. So that's interesting that he's saying here that in Jerusalem, that's where the main church should be. So that's some interesting little history there that we probably don't have a lot of information on where the hiccup happened between Peter and, and James, Peter in, in Rome and um, James in Jerusalem. And I'm sure once we have uh, access to the Vatican Library, we might get more answers to what actually happened there. This goes on to verse 9, And forget not with your prayers and supplication, intercessions, and giving of thanks to offer the incense, as it is written in the last of your prophets, saying, From the rising of the sun and to the setting of the same, incense shall be offered unto my name and in all places with pure oblation, for my name shall be given among the Gentiles. For verily I say unto you, incense is the memorial of the intercession of the saints within the veil, with words that cannot be uttered. This brings us to lecture 94, The Order of the Kingdom, Part 4, Verse 1. And another asked him, saying, Master, how wilt thou that we bury our dead? And Jesus answered, Seek ye counsel of the deacons in the matter, for it concerneth the body only. Verily I say unto you, there is no death for those who believe in the life to come. Death, as ye deemed it, is the door to life, and the grave is the gate to resurrection for those who believe and obey. Mourn ye not, nor weep for them that they have left you, but rather rejoice for their entrance into life. As all creatures come forth from the unseen into this world, so they return to the unseen, and so will they come again till they are purified. So again, another indication that we get many, many chances. We don't get this. It's not just one and done with our lives as humans. We get many chances to be purified. Let the bodies of them that depart be committed to the elements, and the Father and Mother, who reneweth all things, shall give the angels charge over them, and let the presbyter pray that their bodies may rest in peace, and their souls awake to a joyful resurrection. There is a resurrection from the body, and there is a resurrection in the body. There is a rising out of the life of the flesh, and there is a falling into the life of the flesh. So again, that's life, a cycle of, of birth and rebirth and death and birth and death and birth again what we call reincarnation. Let prayer be made for those who are gone before and for those that are alive, for those that are yet to come, and for all are one family in God. In God they live and move and have their being. I mean, for me especially, I don't believe that believing in reincarnation doesn't make you a Christian. I think that's just propaganda and fear-mongering that the church has done. 
um, to people to try to make them vulnerable and make them a captive audience to to their power hungry people. Um, the God I believe in is a very loving God and and will give you multiple times to to grow in your soul. Um, and so that that doesn't to me it doesn't make you not a Christian because you believe in reincarnation at all. Um, so anyway. Verse 4, the body that ye lay in the grave or that is consumed by fire is not the body that shall be, but they who come shall receive other bodies, yet their own, as they have sown in one life, so they shall reap in another. Blessed are they who have worked righteousness in this life, for they shall receive the crown of life. Sounds very Edgar Casey, doesn't it? The things that Edgar Casey would say, and Edgar Casey himself was a very religious man. Okay, so we go on to verse 5. And another one asked him, saying, Master, under the law of Moses, clad the priests with garments of beauty for their ministration in the temple. Shall we also cloth them to whom we commit the ministry of sacred things as thou hast taught us? And Jesus answered, saying, White linen is the righteousness of the saints. But the time truly cometh when Zion shall be desolate. And after the time of her affliction is past, she shall arise and put on her beautiful garments as it is written. But seek ye first the kingdom of righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. In all things seek simplicity, and give not occasion to vainglory. Seek ye first to be clothed with charity, and the garments of salvation, and the robe of righteousness. For what doth it profit if ye have not these? As the sound of brass and tinkering of symbol are ye if ye have not love seek ye righteousness and love and peace and all things of beauty shall be added unto you and yet another asked him saying master how many of the rich and mighty will enter into life and join us who are poor and despised how then shall we carry on the work of god in the regeneration of mankind and jesus said this is also a matter for the deacons for the church and council with the elders but when my disciples are come together on the Sabbath at even or in the morning of the first day of the week, let them each bring an offering of tithe or the tithe of a tithe of their increase as God does prosper them and put it in a treasury for the maintenance of the church and the ministry and the works thereof. For I say unto you, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So he's talking about tithing here, bringing in a little bit of your money that God prospers you with. And I, I do believe in a, a sense of tithing, of, of giving back to whom much is given, much is expected. However, I do not tithe to a church because most, in my opinion, most churches are not good with what they use their money for. I'm tired of seeing these like super like flamboyant churches that are just rich beyond measure, but yet there are homeless people living down the street. I just don't think that's what God meant at all. Um, and so I tend to, when I tithe, I tend to give to charities that I really trust, that are really doing good in the work, in the world. This brings us to the last verse of uh, lection 94. This is verse 10. So shall all things be done recently and in order, and the rest Will the Spirit set in order who proceedeth from the Father and Mother in heaven? I have instructed you now in the first principles, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Lection 95 is the Ascension. Verse 1, And Jesus, after he had shown himself alive to his disciples, after his resurrection, and sojourned with them for ninety days, teaching and speaking of the kingdom, and the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, had finished all things he had to do, led forth the twelve with Mary Magdalene, and Joseph his father, and Mary his mother, and the other holy women as far as Bethany, to the mount called Olive, where he had appointed them. And when they saw him as he stood in the midst of them, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus spake unto them, saying, Behold, I have chosen you from among men, and given you the law and the word of truth. I have set you as the light of the world, and as a city that cannot hide. But the time cometh when darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, and the enemies of truth and righteousness shall rule in my name. Interesting, right? I was just talking about the corruption of the church, and he's basically saying it. The enemies of truth and righteousness shall rule in my name. In my opinion, Pope Francis is one of them, and a lot of other Protestant preachers as well. 
and set up a kingdom of this world and oppress people and cause the enemy to blaspheme, putting forth my doctrines, the opinions of man, and teaching in my name that which I have not taught, and darkening much that I have taught by their traditions. And we know on the Doc Outpost, we've talked about this, the Christian church picked up because Constantine, through the Council of Nicaea, Constantine was not Christian, he was Mithraic, and he put a lot of Mithraic pagan traditions into the Judeo-Christian faith. Verse 4, but be of good cheer, for the time will also come when the truth they have hidden shall be manifested, and the light shall shine, and the darkness shall pass away, and the true kingdom shall be established, which shall be in the world, but not of it, and the word of the righteousness and love shall go forth from the center, even the holy city of Mount Zion, and the mount which is the land of Egypt shall be known as an altar of witness unto the Lord. And now I go to my parent and your parent, my God and your God, but ye tarry in Jerusalem and abide in prayer. And after seven days, ye shall receive power from on high and the promise of the Holy Spirit shall be fulfilled unto you. And ye shall go forth from Jerusalem unto all the tribes of Israel and to the othermost parts of the world. And so we had clarification earlier on in this gospel that is Israel, the tribes of Israel, the Israel people that Jesus spoke about was not an actual country or citizens of a country. Israelites are people on the side of light, of God, not the cabal. They are not Israelites, they are Canaanites. Verse 6 goes on to say, And having said these things, he lifted up his pure and holy hands and blessed them. And it came to pass that while he blessed them, he was parted from them. And a cloud as the sun and brightness received him out of their sight. And as he went up, some beheld him by the feet, and others worshipped him, falling to the earth on their faces. And while they gazed steadfastly into the heavens, behold, two stood by them in white apparel and said, Ye men of Israel, ye stand ye gazing into the heaven, this same Jesus who is taken from you in a cloud, and as ye have seen him go into heaven, shall come again to the earth. Then they returned unto Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is from the city, from the city a Sabbath day journey. And as they returned, they missed Mary Magdalene, and they looked for her, but found her not. And some of the disciples said, The Master hath taken her, and they marveled and were in great awe. Now it was midsummer when Jesus ascended into heaven, and he had not yet attained his fiftieth year, for it was needed that seven times seven years should be fulfilled in his life. Ye that he might be for perfected by the suffering of all experiences, and be an example unto all, to children and parents, to the married and the celibates, to youth and those full of age, and unto all ages, conditions of mortal life. So this actually brings us to 96, which is the last lection of the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. I'm going to be very sad to put this Gospel away, but we must move forward on to our next missing Gospel, which is the Gospel of Cruella, or the Gospel of Q. So this is lecture 96, the pouring out of the Spirit, verse 1. And the disciples were gathered together in the upper room. When they returned from the mount, they all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication, and their number was about one and twenty. And in that day, in that day, James stood up and said, Men and brethren, it is known unto you how the Lord, before he left, chose P Peter to preside over us and watch over us in his name, and how it must needs be that one of those who have been with us and a witness at his resurrection be chosen and appointed to take his place. Verse 3, And they chose two called Barsabas and Matthias, and they prayed and said, Thou Lord, who knowest the hearts of all men, show which of these two hast chosen to take part in the apostleship from which thou dost raise thy servant Peter to preside over us. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and the twelve received him, and he was numbered among the apostles. Then John and James separated Peter from their number by laying on the hands that he might preside over them in the name of the Lord, saying, Brother, be thou as a hewn stone, six squared, even though Petrus, which art Petra, being witness to the truth on every side. And two of the apostles were given staves to guide their steps in the ways of truth and crowns of glory with all, and to the prophets burning lamps to show light on the path and censers with fire, and to the evangelists the book of the holy law to recall the people to the first principles, and to the pastors were given the cup and platter to feed and nourish the flock. 
But to none was given aught that was given to all, for all were one priesthood under Christ as their master, great high priest, in the temple of God. And to the deacons were given baskets that they might carry therein the things needed for the holy worship. And the number was about 120, Peter presiding over them. And when the third day had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And as they prayed, there came the sound from the heavens as a rushing of mighty wind. And the room in which they were assembled was shaken, and it filled the place. And there appeared cloven tongues of flame, of flame like fire, and sat upon the head of each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And Peter stood up and preached the law of Christ unto the multitude of all nations and tongues who were gathered together by the report of what had been seen and heard, each man hearing in his own tongue wherein he was born. And of them that listened, there were there were gathered unto the church that day three thousand souls, and they received the holy law, repented of their sins, and were baptized, and continued steadfastly in the apostles' fellowship and worship, and the oblation and prayers. And they who believed gave up their possessions, and had all things in common, and abode together in one place, showing the love and the goodness of God to their brothers and sisters, and to all creatures, and working with their hands for the common weal. And from these there were called twelve to be prophets with the apostles, and the twelve to be evangelists, and the twelve to be pastors, and their helps which were added unto, unto them, and deacons of the church universal, and they numbered one hundred and twenty. And thus was the tabernacle of David set up, with the living men filled with goodness, even as the master had shown upon them. And to the church in Jerusalem was given James the Lord's brother, for its president and angel, and under him four and twenty priests, and the fourhold ministry, and helpers and deacons also. And after six days, many came together, and they were added six thousand men and women who received the holy law of love, and they received the word with gladness. And as they gathered together on the Lord's day after the Sabbath was passed, and were offering the holy oblation, they missed Mary and Joseph, the parents of Jesus, and they made search, but found them not. And some of them said, Surely the Lord hath taken them away, as he did Magdalene. And they were filled with awe and sung praises to God. So we know Mary Magdalene wasn't actually taken away because she ended up in um, the south of France. I don't believe uh, his parents were taken away either, so it's kind of interesting. I guess we'll keep reading and see what happens if they clear that up, but it might have been that there was just speculation. I, I have no idea. I wasn't there. Verse 16, And the Spirit of God came upon the apostles and the prophets with them, and remembering what the Lord had taught them with one voice, they confessed and praised God, saying, We believe in one God, the infinite, the secret found, the eternal parent, of whom all things invisible and visible, the all in all, through all around, the holy twain, in whom all things consist, who hath been, who is, and who shall be. We believe in one Lord, our Lady, the perfect Holy Christ, God of God, light of light begotten, our Lord the Father, spouse and son, our Lady, the mother, bride and daughter, three modes and one essence undivided, one by and trinity, that God may be manifest as Father, spouse and son of every soul, and every soul may be perfected as the mother, bride and daughter of God. And this by ascent of the soul into spirit, and the descent of the spirit into the soul, who cometh from heaven, and is incarnate of the Virgin ever blessed, in Jesus Maria, in every Christ of God, and is born and teacheth the way of life, and suffereth under the world rulers, and is crucified, and is buried, and descendeth into hell, who riseth again, and ascendeth into glory, from thence giving light and life to all. We believe in the seven hold spirit of God, the life giver, who proceedeth from the holy twain, who cometh upon Jesus Maria and all that are faithful to the light within, who dwelleth in the church, the Israel elect of God, who cometh ever into the world and lighteth every soul that seeks, who giveth the law which judgeth the living and the dead, and who speaketh by the prophets of every age and clime. We believe in one holy, universal, and ap apostolic church, and witness to all truths, the receiver and giver of the same, begotten of the Spirit and fire of God, nourished by the water, seeds, and fruits of earth, who by the Spirit of life, her twelve books and sacraments, her holy word and works, knitteth, knitteth together the elect in one mystical communion and atonement humanity with God, making us partakers in the divine life and substance, betoking the same in the holy symbols. 
and we look for the coming of the universal Christ and the kingdom of heaven, wherein dwelleth righteousness and the holy city whose gates are twelve, wherein are the temple and altar of God. Whence proceeded the three orders in fourfold ministry to each all truth and offer the daily sacrifices of praise. And in the inner, so in the outer, as in the great, so in the small, as in above, so below, as in heaven, so in earth. We believe in the purification of the soul through the many births and experiences, again, reincarnation, the resurrection from the, de the dead and life everlasting of the just, the ages of ages and rest in God forever. Amen. And as the smoke of the incense arose, there was heard the sound of many bells and a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory, honor, praise, and worship be to God, the Father, spouse, and Son, one with the mother, bride, and maid, from whom proceedeth the eternal spirit, by whom are, are all created things from the ages of ages, now to the ages of ages. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. And if any man take from or add to the words of this gospel or hide as under a bushel, the light thereof, which is given by the Spirit through us, the twelve witnesses chosen of God, for the enlightenment of the world unto salvation. Let him be Amenthia Marthana until the coming of Christ, Jesus Maria, our Savior, Savior excuse me, with the holy saints. For them that believe, these things are true. For them that believe not, they are as an idle tale, but to those who with perceiving minds and hearts, reading the spirit rather than the letter which killeth, they are spiritual varieties. For the things that are written are true, not because they are written, but rather they are written because they are true. And these are written, and ye may believe with your hearts and proclaim with your mouths to the salvation of many. Amen. Here ended the holy gospel of the perfect life of Jesus Maria, the Christ, the Son of David after the flesh, and the Son of God after the Spirit. Glory be to God, by whose power and help it has been written. So again, that ends the gospel of the Holy Twelve. Very sad. I'd love to hear y'all's thoughts and opinions. Again, please join us on the Dark Outpost on Tuesday nights where we really talk about this with David Zuplik. We, we give way more commentary, and it's always nice to have somebody else sit there have somebody else's opinion because two minds are are better and mightier than one and I really appreciate all the emails we received of people who have been um very affected by this gospel this has to be one of my favorite gospels I do believe it is a legit gospel um for sure 100 percent I think most of the gospels we've studied so far are legitimate gospels and they bring back the essence of the true Christian faith as as a practice as a spiritual practice not just a crazy dogma so anyway, next week we will start with the book of Q or Quel. Um, I'll probably call it the book of Quel throughout our whole reading because of censorship of the 17th letter of our alphabet. So, um, and I'm sure we're going to have many comparisons to it because of what's happening as we're living through the apocalypse right now and all this stuff is resurfacing. So I would, again, love to hear your opinions in the comment section below. Please be kind to each other. Remember the law of love. Thank you to Josh McKay for doing our music. If you would like to purchase the opening song, there is a link in the description box. And thank you for Todd Roderick for um, helping me get this video out to you guys today. I will talk to you soon. Bye.